Hello and welcome to the Weekly Wrap for October 16th, 2020. I'm Seth Miller from Paxx.era. And I'm Marianne Simpson from Apex Media. This week on the Weekly Wrap, our guest is Elise Weber from Skytra, which is a London-based Airbus subsidiary that wants to help the air travel industry risk manage its revenue volatility. And that's something that's surely top of mind for the industry these days, given the unprecedented circumstances we're in. A lot of challenges there. You better believe it. Uh, but first, it's been quite a week for CEOs stepping down. Indeed it has. Alex Cruz, uh, CEO of British Airways, is stepping down to be replaced by Sean Doyle, who previously ran Aer Lingus. Um, you know, th this one was... Uh, Bit of an interesting move. There's some concern about, you know, can, can the industry recover? How quickly will it recover? And is Alex the right person to lead? And with BA and IAG saying that they think it's going to be at least 2023 until we really get to the point where they're back to 2019 travel levels, uh, it looks like uh, Alex Cruz is not going to ride it out and try to get there with the rest of the company. Well, I'm sure it's been a tough year for Alex. I kind of, uh, you know, I understand anybody in a role like his that wants to step down, um, including Paul Skura. We also heard just today of Virgin Australia is also going to be stepping back from his role as CEO there. Uh, it looks like he's going to stick it out until November when the management moves over to Bain Capital, which is, of course, uh, the U.S. Um, is it hedge fund? Yeah, we'll go with hedge fund. Private equity. Yeah. Right. That's, um, you know, helping the airline get through this time and will be assuming ownership. And uh, basically reports are saying that he just doesn't agree with their vision um, for the airline, which he believes is going to be a low cost carrier. It sounds like some of the um, employee unions are also quite concerned about it becoming a low cost carrier uh, and thus having fewer staff. Uh, but he'll be replaced in November by Jane Herlichka, who's former head of uh, rival Qantas's low-cost uh, subsidiary Jetstar. Yeah, th there's a, a lot of drama going on with the Virgin Australia uh, sort of bankruptcy recovery Bain deal and what's going to happen about that. Uh, the company continues to issue statements promising that they're going to remain what they're calling a value carrier, keeping a two-cabin service and whatnot in its domestic uh, operations, but they are cutting back to all 737s, dropping the long-haul service um, uh, and things like that. So definitely some transition there and some changes. So it'll be interesting to see how that plays out. Uh, in more CEO news, though, there's also uh, some changes going on in the in-flight connectivity world. Uh, David Helfgott has taken over as the CEO for SmartSky, the air-to-ground network connectivity provider uh, based in North Carolina here in the U.S. Um, and that's the company's sort of calling it a transition from the research and development phase to the deployment and operation phase and bringing in someone new to help run that system. Um, yeah, and Dave sounds like a, a guy who's really well prepared to handle the job. He uh, has served in the past as CEO of Phasor, which is a phase array antenna maker that was recently acquired by Hanwha Systems. Uh, he was the president and CEO of Inmarsat's government um, division. He was the president of Tactical Wireless Communications for Cobham, <laughs> uh, which is an antenna maker, and also president and CEO of SES's government division. So there's a lot of experience there, and there's a lot of knowledge of, um, of the antenna market as well. Yeah, absolutely. And that's something that the, uh, the company certainly needs some help with right now. They're actually in the midst of a couple different lawsuits related to some of the antenna and ground systems manufacturing. So that's not great news uh, for them. They've had to transition to a new supplier that they're working through those things right now. And that's delayed the rollout until 2021 uh, for the system. On the plus side, they did win a uh, patent lawsuit or win a case brought against them by GoGo -Go in the patent courts recently. So that is uh, a good good legal outcome. But a lot, of, a lot of balls in the air, a lot of things for Dave to have to work his way through there. Yeah, it sounds like he'll have a bit of uh, red tape to untangle there, but I'm sure um, he's feeling up to the task. Uh, also this week, Talus in-flight connectivity. Um, their products got a real boost, didn't it? It did. This is the uh, KA band satellite Wi-Fi service that was announced, I think, 2017-ish. Um, they announced customers in 2018. Uh, Spirit Airlines was the first customer to announce. We also know that Air Canada is putting it on its 737 MAX fleet. Um, and when it was originally announced as with Spirit as the customer in 2018, they expected to have the full fleet installed by summer 2019, and that did not happen. Uh, there were some troubles along the way, some uh, growing pains or teething pains, if you will. Uh, but the company is pretty confident that they've solved all those challenges now. They've got the antenna system ready to go. And 
They announced a deal with STS Aeromod in Melbourne, Florida to get 100 planes installed in the coming year, which is a, a very rapid push to get this system into the sky. Yeah, especially if you consider that STS basically says a single install takes about three days. Um, so that does sound like a tight schedule. No days off for these guys, huh? Absolutely not. Seth, uh, what do you know about financial futures and hedging? Uh, that if you're in the airline industry, it's a very cyclical market, and my odds of getting it right at anything more than about six months out are roughly nil. <laughs> well, that's a lot more than I know, um, and our guest on the show this week knows a lot more than both of us put together, uh, obviously. Um, she is Elise Weber, and um, she holds two diplomas in communications and it and has an executive MBA with majors in finance and marketing. She spent 15 years at Airbus in a variety of management roles, which basically included things like communications and performance management, um, lean and business process improvement, strategy and business development. So this is a smart lady with a lot of experience. And now she's the co-founder and chief um, of sales and marketing for Skytra, which like I said earlier, is an Airbus subsidiary, and they're looking to reinvent risk management uh, for the air travel sector. So without further ado, I will welcome Elise to the show. Welcome, Elise. Thanks for joining us. Thanks, Marianne. Thanks for the great intro. And I'm really thrilled to be here today and to share with you and the audience which value propositions we at Skytra are bringing to market. Elise, Skytra was founded to help solve a revenue visibility and volatility issues for the industry. Can you talk to us a little bit about more detail of what that issue is and how Skytra is helping address it? Skytra was born to really strengthen the aviation industry by bringing two resources to market. One is about risk management. It's more for airline treasury managers. It's a new hedging product that is complementing the existing toolkit. Today, as you know, the a uh, treasury um, team of an airline can hedge, for example, the fuel cost. But there is nothing on the other side. Tomorrow, thanks to the Skytra price indices, they will be also able to hedge the revenues. By this, they will be able to make the EBIT more predictable and to do better long-term investments. This is key right now. To complement this first value proposition, we are also bringing to market consolidated aviation data. Yields, for example, volumes and revenues will be available on a daily basis so that decision takers of airlines or revenue managers can take timely decisions on a daily basis during these volatile times. Elise, can we dig in a little bit further there um, and maybe just let us know a little bit more about exactly how Skytra is using data to help airlines and other air travel stakeholders predict their future revenues? Thanks, Marianne. That's an excellent question. Let me build on what I've said before on the AirTix business intelligence product. So we have built up this Skytra ticketing database covering 83% of worldwide tickets by value. We see more than 400 airlines and we have the data on the lowest granularity on a ticketing level and it gets updated on a daily basis. So once you have this incredible asset, you can give out bespoke data depending on what you want to achieve. So if, for example, you are in charge of revenue management in an airline, what you can see is, for example, on a given origin and destination, at what level prices are selling for flights taking off in one month, in two months, or three months' time, for example. So it's a valuable information for pricing. If, for example, you are an airport, you can look at volumes. You can exactly know every day how many passengers will be landing in my airport. And you can plan accordingly for your security stuff, your shops, whatever you need to plan. That's really valuable too. Another use case, for example, if you want to sell or buy air travel, so let's imagine a corporate who wants to buy air travel from an airline, Typically, they negotiate discounts on public fares. But what is the public fare? We can provide, as a third party, reference prices for all specific ONDs or on the regional level. And this can be used for contracting and negotiation. So it's powerful because it brings transparencies for both sides. And therefore, it's a perfect tool for decision-taking and negotiation. 
So you can see, depending on what you want to achieve, we can provide the bespoke data and help you to take the right decisions. Doing this sort of big data analysis requires having a lot of background information to start from to generate all these indices. Where are you getting that data? Who's providing the information that you're using to help pull it all together and come up with this coherent picture? So you want to know more in detail how we're actually building the world's biggest ticketing database. We're working with two data suppliers. The first one is IATA DDS. It stands for Direct Data Solution. And it's unique because it contains the transaction, the ticket transaction for direct sales and indirect sales for many airlines over the world. We get this data feed on a daily basis and on a ticketing level. So just to give an order of magnitude, in 2019, we got 1.6 billion tickets delivered by IATA. But we also have a second data source. It's offered pricing. This comes from Kiwi.com. In 2019, we got 20 billion price checks per day. And what we're doing is that we're cross-referencing these two databases. We take every single ticket from IATA and allocate a pricing from Kiwi.com, which gives us a good estimation of every ticket price. So you can imagine that once you have this, you can aggregate the data as you wish in order to get the information out that you need for decision taking. And this is really unique. All right, Elise, and finally, what can Skytra's database tell us about activities and trends that are going on right now? That's a very dangerous question. I try to keep it short. So let me use the Skytra price indices to illustrate what we could see during these volatile times. So the SkyTrap price indices measure the price of air travel in the various regions. The unit of value is the cents per RPK. So the US dollars per revenue passenger kilometer. So it's what an airline is generating for transporting one passenger one kilometer. So it's a nice normalized way to look at prices all over the globe. If we look, for example, what happened in North America, this was one of the most stable markets in terms of yields, so in terms of cents per RPK. But what happened in April is that the yields totally collapsed, minus 40% compared to last year. This was the most extreme price drop we've saw. And then the yield recovered a bit, but now actually they're back at almost minus 40%. So these trends are not the same, for example, in Europe. In Europe, what happened in April was a price decrease of 20%. So it was less extreme than in the US. And the summer actually looked really promising. The yields were really back on track. But now it's even worse than in April. So it's a total roller coaster. And surprisingly, on other regions, if you, for example, look at Europe, to Asia, what happened there is that the prices only fell slightly in March, April, and then the opposite happened. They went through the roof plus 40% compared to last year because it was driven by essential traffic. So little capacity was left and people had to pay a lot for, to come from A to B. So in a nutshell, it's total roller coaster on all the markets in terms of pricing. Volatility has increased dramatically, but the shape of this volatility is different from market to market, and the usual seasonalities are totally broken, and this is really unique. Super interesting stuff there from Skytra, a uh, big opportunity, big industry to sort of fill in with some of this data. It'll be interesting to see just how well they succeed in helping to uh, solve some of those sort of trading and industry problems of that visibility and coming up with what the answers are. Yeah, absolutely, Seth. Um, I totally agree. And moving along now to our final thought of the day, uh, we thought we'd take you from airspace to outer space or at least uh, orbit for now. 
Uh, Relativity Space has just moved into a brand new factory sort of production facility in Long Beach, California. And we picked up on, on this story by CNBC uh, where they interviewed a bunch of the people involved in the project. Um, for those of you who are not in the know is that, that Relativity Space, they're basically trying to build this rocket using 95% 3D printed uh, parts. The only parts of this rocket that are not going to be 3D printed are the electronics. Um, and basically this is a first for the industry and uh, it's something that's just really funky and cool. It is. They're, they're talking about the Terran 1 rocket, uh, about 730 different components uh, in the piece. So that's compared to, you know, probably one hundredth of what a normal rocket would uh, consist of. And a lot of that comes from the 3D printing. Um, and the idea is that they will actually be able to generate a rocket a month from this uh, 3D printing additive manufacturing solution. It's uh, kind of incredible. Yeah, it's really cool. I mean, these 3D printers they have are absolutely massive. They're capable of, of producing a, a sheet of metal that's 32 feet long, which is the same height as the ceiling in the factory that they're in. Uh, they've got three print, sorry, seven printers running right now. They're on their third generation of printers. So basically what they keep doing is because they are the maker of the printers and the end user, they're able to update every time they learn something about the process or find a way to improve the process, they can create a new printer that's better and they expect this to basically transfer over to the rockets as well so each time they create a process they will learn because they are so vertically integrated um, that you know they'll be able to make the process faster make the rockets lighter and more efficient and everything like that yeah that is really cool stuff have we been spending a little too much time inside uh not going anywhere that we're ready to climb on these rockets now i'm, I'm not sure yeah i think so i'm ready to get on the rocket um I know that these these guys uh, right now they're just sort of working on satellite rockets, getting satellites into orbit. But uh, the company leaders do say that they've got Mars as a final target, uh, and I think the only other person who's trying to go to Mars is Elon Musk. So I do sense a bit of rivalry going on there as well. Excellent. All right. Well, that's all the time we have for today. Thank you everybody for watching the weekly wrap. Please like and subscribe if you enjoyed this video, even if you didn't. <laughs> and uh, make sure you tune in next week for the weekly wrap. Visit www.apex.aero and paxx.aero for all your aviation news. Bye-bye. Take care.